you know, I think that's very important to take your swimming or any sport to another level is to have such a passion for it that you're always looking for an answer as what can make you better. What is it that was so unique or so instinctual about your racing technique that you now emphasize and bring to practice on a routine basis? Like we said, I had to take that race stroke that I had developed and that I had a natural ability when competition was on the line and I had to pursue that in practice if I was going to get better. And what that was was my ability to use my strength and size for powerful strokes, getting in distance per stroke. And that was done through maximizing my line. And when I'm saying my line, I'm saying that I want to be in the least resistance position as possible while I'm swimming. And that's my streamlined position. So I wanted to use my pull and kick and perfect a technique that allowed me to be in that long line the most amount of time. And, and what that was was developing strength, my aerobic capacity to have that in practice and to be able to mirror image what I was doing in competitions for a longer period of time in training. And that would relate to me becoming a better breaststroker. So how do you bring freshness to a sport that uh, has so much repetition? Short-term challenges. That, that, that's the only way. You can't sit there on Monday and say, this weekend I want to do this X amount of time. You got to sit there on Monday and say tonight at practice I want to do this and if I don't do this that's not going to allow me to do what I want to do on Saturday. Come Tuesday you got to repeat the process. So you got to look at each day as a new day and a new challenge. And I don't look at it as the big picture because again not many people can swim and stare at a black line for five hours. It's a draining process but you have to find little tasks each day that excite the athlete. Your mental side. Tell me a little bit about how you set up the mental side of your approach, both to training and certainly to the best performance possible. Well, the mental side, like you said, is just as demanding as the physical side. I feel like, you know, when I come to practice, that that's almost the easy part. That you know, any physical demand you throw at me, I'm going to give it my best. But um, there are mental aspects that involve sacrifice and uh, effort and, and where they're going in your life. You know, you can't just go out there and work hard every day and give it your all and expect that that's going to do it. There are ups and downs with everything. I think if you try and minimize those and uh, see the big picture and, and realize that there are other things in life that are just as important to you, you can have a peace of mind and, and continue on with that path. And tell me once again who your favorite face to see is at 4.30 in the morning. My favorite face to see at 4.30 in the morning is the back of my eyelids because I don't get up that early, first of all. <laughs> An important aspect of cross-training swimming with dry land is that you maintain the integrity of your stroke. A lot of the work that I'll do here will be emphasized particularly in paralleling what I do in the water. We want work that is specific and directed towards what we want. So by coming up with a dry land routine that directly mirrors what the stroke would look like or what we're trying to achieve in the water, I think we have increased performance. Everything that I do in dry land has an impact directly on my stroke, whether it's knee flexion, ankle flexion, maintaining the core line, anything that I think is going to overload the body so when I swim breaststroke it's going to feel like I'm floating. <laughs> 
toys that I use are just going to reinforce our philosophy with breaststroke with the kick and the pull. They're just going to put resistance in the motion that we're trying to stress. So it's an overload. Stretch cord attached to a bucket. They obviously made this one a little easy by putting some holes in the bottom. If I'm stressing them to a higher range of degree than I would when I'm swimming, my body will adjust to that and feel like that range is being adapted into my stroke. Probably one of my more favorite ones is the stretch cord. This is going to attach to my waist and as you can imagine, tied into pretty much a leash. And I'll use anything that will force my ankle position to be more extreme than normal, anything to force my knee position to be more than normal. It's your standard weight belt. This one feels like it's about 10 pounds. Anything to feel my line more than normal. So what we're trying to do is overload these areas so that when I do swim the stroke, they feel natural and strong to me at the same time. I mean, you name it, as long as it's making me tired, we're using it. We began with a standard paddle and just used finger tubing to strap it on somewhat awkwardly to the inside of the foot to create more resistance when he kicked in breaststroke. What I saw in that was similar to what you see with any type of training. You put a resistance somewhere where you want it, you stress that resistance, and then you build up strength to it. Ed tailored the cut to the contour of his ankle. I readjusted the holdings, sawed it down, put some cool designs on it to make it unique to myself, and this thing worked. Now with a better fit and positioning new holes for extra finger tubes, you're gonna have a more refined engineered kick paddle for breaststrokers. A squeeze method would not work with these paddles. What we're trying to do is have a full flexion with a push back and a close. And, and this paddle allowed that. And that was a huge step, I think, to developing my kick. The breaststroke kicking machine, it's the same concept we're trying to achieve here, is resistance against the ankles in the kick to develop strength in your kick. First time he used it, he came back and said that the tension coming off the heel didn't create pressure the way he'd like to feel the kick. So when you went to kick, the tension was coming from an ankle point that, that really wasn't relevant to your kick. It was just more relevant to an extension. You can get that same force by going in the weight room. So we re-engineered it so that the point of tension was coming from the outside of the foot. Okay, and what this allowed was when the tension were to tighten and you would have to pull against it, it would flex your foot out in the proper breaststroke position. You can't go into a weight room and reproduce the kick like you can in the water. So we want to put the resistance in the same fashion that the kick is. And this toy is allowing us to do that. The paddles are allowing us to do that. It would reproduce the effect of a resistance training against this ankle flexed kick that allows for when I take this off, you know, I'm going to feel exactly like you would if you were swimming with paddles when you take it off, that you have a good catch and you're maximizing your range of motion. Has anybody ever beat you in challenges on those toys? I don't, I don't let that happen. There's no way. <laughs> There's a combination of ways of putting this catch, this anchoring of your hands, and this direct kick with your pull. There's a timing. 1027 now, right on world record pace. The timing is where all the power comes from. We're going to take a full pull into an explosive kick that's going to allow for the fastest and strongest position I have in my entire stroke. I have a certain stroke count that I follow in practice regardless of the distance, regardless of the effort, regardless of the speed. And it's there day in and day out and I acknowledge it. You know, I don't just let it happen. I have good clock awareness and I maintain stroke counts that I know throughout practice. I'm not just going through the motions again. I understand what I'm doing. What you want to do is feel your stroke, and obviously that's going to be unique to you, but the crucial part is the timing between your pull and your kick. 
And what I think about when I'm swimming breaststroke is that I want to kick my hands forward and get into the streamlined, long line position more time than anybody else. So that's the philosophy that I think is that I want to anchor and kick my body forward over that anchor to allow for maximum distance for stroke. Two things we're going to look at here is the line position and the leg draw. We're going to pause it right here and show you that from end to end we're looking at a straight line. That's the core line that we've been talking about. You want to be as tight as you can be and as long as you can be because we're maximizing the straight there. Follow the red line from the tip of my fingers to my toes. That's what we want. That's that core body line that we're talking about. The next important thing that we're going to analyze is the knee flexion and ankle flexion. Right there is what we're looking at. The angle right there, the knee flexion. We're trying to maximize that knee flexion to have a huge range in our kick. It's allowing about 15 degrees of flexion in there and then our ankles are going to be flexed as much as we can. This is going to allow for the greatest amount of water to be moved. And as we proceed a little further, what we're going to watch is my ankles right there. See how the ankle has totally been flexed out. It's perpendicular to the leg. And at that point, we're catching the most water. And then we're going to follow through into a full kick and return exactly to that position that we talked about, the straight line position. After the kick, we're going to lead into the pull, which is going to be our anchoring position. We have the straight line, as showed here. And the next thing we're going to do is going to want to anchor the arms at a point away from the body. So the point here is to hold as much water as you can at these anchor points and pull the core through these anchors. Just like I said, we're going to pull. Imagine that you have a ring and you're grabbing it and pulling the core line through. I'm going to anchor as wide as I can. That's a feel. And my next step that I'm going through in my head is I'm going to pull my body over my hands by holding the water. So at this point right now, I'm holding the water concentrating on keeping my line, holding my head over my hands so I can breathe. And the next step is getting the hands out of the way and I'm thinking about maximum flexion in my knees immediately after. After that step, ankle flexion. Right now I'm thinking about pushing back as much water as I can while maintaining this straight line through my core. That's gonna be the fastest position that I can be in. I'm gonna finish the full kick, that's my goal and return back to the straight line and start all over again. The next step through my head again, anchor. I'm gonna push wide with my hands, holding the water, keeping my head in line, and then again, back to that step, I'm gonna be kicking my head over top of this anchor and then returning to that fast position. Head over hands, straight line, kicking the hands forward. That's what's going through my head while I'm swimming. Do you think you know the perfect stroke count, the perfect tempo that you need to bring out for the perfect grade? No, I, I don't think so. I answer that no because if I did, I would have done it by now and I'm not going to set that limit on myself. I don't think there's ever a perfect race. I think there's too many factors involved in swimming that there will ever be a perfect race. But at the same time, I'm trying to achieve the best possible race that I can at that moment. And before that moment, I'm trying to set myself up to believe that I've done everything possible. And, and that's the sense that I think you have, that you can be at your best, but you can never be perfect because we're getting back to that point that you can't rest on what you've done. You know, there's always more to be had.